Great. So our next speaker uh, is Arushi Kansal. She is a senior engineer at Netlify, and she's going to be talking to us about putting the engineer in AI. Um, outside of being a senior engineer, I believe she's recently shared with us that she's become a recent TikTok enthusiast. So Arushi, do you want to uh, do you want to tell us what that's all about? I haven't used it myself. Um, yeah, TikTok uh, turns out when you're in quarantine, it's a great way to have fun, but also make yourself feel super old. Um, but <laughs> Have you uh, posted any videos yourself? Uh, yeah, that's how I know I'm super old now. Okay, <laughs> cool. Well, Arishi, if you're ready, we'll go ahead and let you uh, take us away. Um, okay, great. Um, so um, as you know, my name is Arushi, um, and um, I'm a senior engineer. Um, and in my previous roles, I've worked on um, building out machine learning infrastructure. Um, even, uh, so, you know, involving, uh, like data scientists, um, researchers and engineers. Um, and it's just something that I'm also, um, quite interested in. Um, so this was, uh, originally supposed to be, um, uh, more of a, uh, demo combined with theory. Um, but obviously for, uh, current reasons, um, I'll make this more of an introduction. Um, and so more theoretical, um, and what some of the practices or, uh, the experiences that I've had. Um, when it comes to actually um, putting your machine learning in production. Um, so just to uh, uh, give you a brief introduction on the, uh, the topics that we'll cover, um, first will be why do we even care um, what people think machine learning is, um, what it actually is, um, some of the problems um, that you'll, you might face, um, some of the practices uh, to bridge um, that gap or those problems, um, as well as briefly touching on the current state and some of the tools that are available without focusing too much, uh, without trying to focus too much on uh, what specific tools you should use. Um, cool. So firstly, why do we care? So I guess um, in terms of why we care about uh, this concept of putting machine learning in production, um, really comes down to the fact that um, originally machine learning as a research field um, is actually quite mature, right? Um, so in academia or at universities, um, research has been happening for in, in this field um, since, you know, the 80s, since the 90s. But um, now with like the increase in compute power um, and just the way that industry is going, machine learning is rapidly entering industry, right? So when you think about all of the big tech companies, um, they're all using um, some form of machine learning. Um, when we talk about autonomous cars, um, and even the fact that um, now machine learning is being pushed out to end users as well. So if you look at um, uh, Facebook and Instagram's um, application Spark AR, which allows you to build those um, video and photo filters, um, that's using a huge amount of like computer vision uh, and machine learning to allow somebody who might not have any technical background to still do, um, you know, face tracking, uh, to do um, uh, hand, hand gesture movements. Um, so basically, it's something that is relevant to every single person now. Um, secondly, we care um, because there's also, uh, if we don't understand machine learning as an engineering principle, um, so we can't uh, reason about it or we can't understand um, what's gone wrong when things do go wrong and they definitely will um, there's lots of scope for misuse then if it's just seen as a black box um, where you know you put something in something comes out and you hope for the best um, so that's kind of why we care about these engineering practices um, so that there's a st standard way of doing things um, so, you know, you can replicate things, you can reproduce things, and most importantly, you can reason about it. So, um, what most people think uh, machine learning is, especially if you're someone like me who doesn't have an academic uh, background in this space, is you build a model, right? That's the words, the two words that kind of get thrown around a lot. So, it's kind of like the concept of you mix, you have some maths, you have some black magic and then you profit. You combine the two and voila, you have money. Um, and that's the concept of it being a bit of a black box um, 
to, uh, uh, to people like us. But what it actually is, it's that you have a large amount of data. And usually this data has some kind of pattern in it, whether it's a pattern that's identified by a person or by a machine. And then you have a bunch of different algorithms that you can try out to find those patterns. And then you combine those two for future predictions. So as you get more incoming data um, or incoming inputs, you combine the two um, and you're able to um, uh, make predictions based on those patterns. So when you say it like that, it's quite, um, it, it almost becomes kind of boring a little bit. It's um, literally a form of statistics almost. Um, and what, but what, where the, pro, uh, the profit or the benefit comes from is actually being able to leverage those insights or those predictions. And that's where it um, kind of becomes a lot more interesting as an engineering, uh, as both uh, from a technical perspective as well as a people perspective. And this is also where all of the problems um, come into it. So um, one thing I would say, and this probably applies to most um, tech problems, um, is that majority of the time it's not a tech problem. There's always technology available. There's always a way to build something usually. It's usually the, uh, a people problem, isn't it, right? Of how we work together, how we structure the work that we're doing. Um, um, and that's the same thing uh, with machine learning and production. And so in my experience, the biggest problem that um, I think from a people perspective that I've faced is that um, there are people with different um, skill sets, different knowledge, and different um, concerns, right? So um, for example, when we're, when we're talking about machine learning, we'll have a data scientist, right? And the things that she sort of cares about are more related to um, data exploration, analysis. Um, she wants, uh, so she wants to be able to easily, um, uh, you know, go through all of the data that you might have. She wants to be, at, to be able to really easily analyze it and get a feel of it. And then she wants to be able to work with that data, split it into your test, um, your validation data. And then she also wants to be able to really easily apply all these different algorithms, um, use all the latest um, frameworks, you know, the ones that are, that all, um, that like Facebook and Google's of the world are putting out there. Um, and she usually works on some kind of a personal workspace, right? So something like a Jupyter Notebook um, or Google's uh, Colab, um, um, and these are some of the, I guess you could say buzzwords or the frameworks and libraries that she, she's um, got going on in her mind, right? And then you have this, your uh, almost traditional software engineers. And what she cares about is, pro is more around how to deploy um, what the data scientist has come up with, how to automate everything so she's not being constantly uh, pinged for stuff or she doesn't feel like um, half of her day is just, um, you know, doing like fiddling around with um, just some tiny things that could have easily just been a script. Um, and she probably cares about the infrastructure as well, right? Um, she's going to be the one that's going to be responsible for um, uh, scaling up um, as, you know, as your business grows. And she really does, and she really cares about um, the monitoring and the observ observability as well, right? So she it's likely that she'll be one of the people that are that's on call and when things go wrong she needs to be able to easily see why things have gone wrong how she can roll back um, and just be able to explain uh, what's happened and obviously she cares about integrating into apps as well and so some of the things that are kind of more buzzwords for her she cares more about um, you know, messaging, um, she's building, she's working with um, CI and CD tools. Um, she's thinking about um, the database, um, how, how to make that stable. Um, she's thinking about how, how to deploy things. Um, so when you put all of those concerns together, it's gone from just being build a model to something like this, where you've got your data coming in, you've got the steps around the data of like exploring, splitting, training, um, building the model, deploying uh, validation, and then continuously doing those last few steps. Um, so like you can see, the model part is actually quite small now. Um, so basically from that, you can kind of understand that the requirements here from a people perspective is t 
teamwork, right? Hybrid teams, um, usually you're going to have a data scientist, software engineer, data engineer, DevOps people working all together. Um, what this also implies, though, is that um, people can't just sit in their own uh, comfort zones anymore, right? So, for example, data scientists and researchers can't be just pure research. They need to be able to, they need to start applying um, engineering and coding principles, right? So stuff like um, versioning, mod code modularization, um, making sure their code uh, is held to a certain um, level of quality um, so that other people can read it. And just in that, set, in that way, software engineers also can't just uh, see machine learning or data as a black box that's not relevant to them at all. They, while they might not be built, working with the maths themselves, they still need to understand um, what's happening so they can empath empathize with the data scientist and work together. So basic, and, and they, everybody needs to be involved in the DevOps practices, right? And everybody needs to understand um, why things need to be automated, um, why everything should be checked into source control, and um, why um, CI and CD is so important. If you don't have this, you're, it's very likely that you'll end up going down the path of the traditional waterfall um, uh, flow of throw it over the wall and then it becomes someone else's problem. So, you know, things like where you'll have somebody literally sharing a zip file um, and then, and that's where the tension comes into it. Um, so now looking at the technical components, um, so I, these aren't, so these are more um, the concepts rather than the specific steps that you need. So the very first one um, that I talk about is um, data. So here we're not talking about the data engineering part of it. Um, we're talking about once you already have all of that set up within your company, you know, whether that's your uh, BI team or your data engineer team. But we do borrow some concepts from data engineering. So the basically the way that um, you know, data scientists will be working on their um, Jupyter notebooks is is basically ETL in the sense of, uh, well, it's actually ELT, but in the sense of that they're extracting some subset of the data, they're um, loading it into their Jupyter notebook, they're transforming it, and then they're applying their um, algorithms and they're building their models. So this is where, um, where um, it comes down to data scientists uh, needing to have um, data like good coding practices around data you know so um things like uh, making sure uh, that every step that they're taking is uh, is a step in itself so it's um if if you're doing your extraction it's that's a script in itself or a piece of code um and this is really important for two reasons reproducibility um and readability so reproducibility we need to be able to do this over and over again especially when we're getting new data and we want to improve our model readability because um, like I said it needs to be a hybrid team where anybody is able to understand at least what is happening um, and another important aspect here is data versioning right so um, really what's really important here is that you version every single thing so this means your models like your pickle files um, your data your intermediate files as well so even um, even if um, even if a person thinks that this intermediate Terry stuff isn't important, it should still be versioned. And here, um, uh, here, like you can use whatever tools you want, but the one that I found quite useful is um, called DVC, um, which is a data version uh, control system. Um, and it, it's great because it just works on top of Git, so there's less of a learning curve there. Um, and the next step is, uh, the next concept is validation, testing, and monitoring. So here, Again, it's um, so when we talk about like your traditional software engineering or your traditional apps, um, the practice here is usually that um, for testing and validation, you'll have some kind of unit tests and integration tests. And these are a uh, requirement um, for your CI pipeline to be green or to be able to deploy. The problem here with machine learning is that it's not as uh, black and white or it's not as binary. You don't always just get 100% uh, pass with a model or 100% a fail. And this is where, again, um, comes down to uh, collaborating as a team to figure out the metrics and what level of accuracy or, um, or uncertainty is actually okay to you. So, you know, the data scientist needs to be together with, their, with, the, with the engineer and ideally with somebody from product or from the business side 
because this is where, again, the issue comes into where data scientists want, you know, as much accuracy as possible and uh, to build the most amazing thing, but that might actually slow down production. And maybe in reality, it's not that important to have um, the ideal uh, model or the ideal metrics. Um, and then the next uh, concept is deployment. Um, so the two ways that I've found of working with deploying um, is A, uh, embedding your model within your, uh, within your apps um, or uh, deploying it as a separate service. Um, both of them have pros and cons. So uh, with the embedded model, uh, while uh, in some ways it's a little bit easier because you're literally just deploying it alongside uh, your application and latency obviously becomes lower as well. Um, uh, one thing I found is that um, with that though, you get tied down to uh, what language you can use alongside this model. Um, and But then the model deployed as a separate service, um, which is great because then you can version your model separately to your consuming applications. Um, uh, the problem that I found there is that um, so, uh, like your result from your model is usually going to be something that's you know like a whole bunch of just uh, JSON response with just a whole bunch of numbers. And not all languages are built to be able to process um, those kind of numbers so easily. So for example, Python, which is kind of the lingua franca of, of um, data science, has loads of libraries to deal with that. But if you use something like Go in your consuming uh, consumer app, uh, it becomes a lot more difficult. Um, and but yeah, so there's a lot of different ways that you can um, deploy in these two different methods as well. Um, so things like there's already open source libraries available uh, or frameworks. Um, so you know things like Kubeflow serving, um, TensorFlow serving within TensorFlow Extended, um, Selden Core, and these help um, a lot with uh, being able to just specify where your model lives, and it just automatically pulls down the latest version. Um, Alternatively, um, what I found is that you can literally just build a Docker image um, and deploy that to, to your cluster. So it comes down to what works uh, within your company and how mature you are in your uh, machine learning uh, journey. And then the last thing that's really important is um, CI and CD as well. So this is where um, it's important in two aspects. One is for, um, I think it helps if a data scientist or a researcher who experience in deploying to production is able to see everything going end to end um, and seeing it being used and then they then I feel like they start to see the importance of um, of putting everything together even at the risk of not having your ideal model um, and it's also important so that um, when the things are going uh, so that you're actually sitting down and uh, determining the metrics together um, so that later on when things do go wrong, um, you're able to understand what's happening. Um, so if you put it all together, um, it kind of ends up, oh, sorry. Oh, um, so if you, when you put it all together, it kind of ends up um, looking a little bit more like this, where you have all of your data, um, whether it's your data lake or your data mesh or whatever architecture in your company, you have a data scientist workspace where they should be pushing everything to version control um, which is being pulled down to, um, with your CI CD um, pipeline. And that's where it's getting deployed to either, you know, your, if you're storing it in S3, your models, or you're deploying it to your um, cluster, or whether you're pushing it to an application. Um, and yeah, so lastly, the current state, like I mentioned, there are a whole bunch of different um, tools available, like um, Kubeflow, TensorFlow, Extended, uh, Metaflow. Um, the main thing here is to understand um, where you where you personally sit, where your company sits in terms of your machine learning um, uh, endeavors, right? So maybe it's enough. Maybe you don't need all of these big tools because um, they do come with a lot of different things. Maybe it's enough for you to just start writing scripts and getting the feel uh, that that's kind of just fit together and getting the feel of how, what this might look like um, for you. Um, yeah, and that was a brief uh, theoretical introduction into uh, machine learning practices. Um, I hope it was a little bit insightful for you guys. Thank you so much, Arushi. I'm going to go ahead and let everybody uh, unmute themselves and send any questions via the chat or just say them live if you have any.
Okay. Um, yeah. So we have one here. Uh, like I said, you can send them. You can send them on the regular chat to everybody. But uh, it says, what CI/CD pipeline tool should we use for machine learning? Um, so here, I found that you can kind of use any uh, anything because it's really just setting up your stages. Um, one that uh, worked quite well for me was Argo CD, um, and it worked quite nicely with Selden Core, which is what we decided to go with for uh, packaging our models. Cool. Hi, Arushi. I have a, I have a question for you. So. Uh, what's your most used library for machine learning? I mean, is it Keras or TensorFlow? What, what's your favorite one? Um, so I don't really like going down the path of what's my favorite library, because I think the whole practice should be that you should be able to plug and play with whatever you want. Um, but I do quite like TensorFlow, not just, uh, but more because of the infrastructure that's already available around it. Um, so like I mentioned, TensorFlow Extended, um, in term, that works quite well. That's why I like TensorFlow, but in terms of libraries, it's ideal that you can use whatever you want. 